So hello again, everyone, and welcome to uh, the monthly interview that we are hosting here at the EPA. And tonight we are welcoming Safira Bjarno. And Safira is uh, in Norway at the moment and comes from Norway. So you will enjoy our Nordic accents from different uh, <laughs> perspectives tonight. And Safira has um, an interesting perspective, an interesting thing that she will share with us. And we will talk about addiction and sobriety and dependency and everything that has to do with that. And I would like to introduce you a little bit and then you can fill in yourself, Safira. You, are, uh, you have a doctor's degree in psychotherapy and you wrote your thesis about the dynamics of the will in treatment of addiction. And uh, of course, we as psychosynthesis practitioners, we, we already get it there that this will be also something about the psychosynthesis and the transpersonal. So would you say something about how that started and how you ended up working with this? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see you, see everybody, and um, uh, it's such an honor to be asked to do this. And thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Eva. Um, I um, well parallel to um, working in my own private practice as a psychosynthesis psychotherapist. I also have been working in the, um, the ward and working with the drug addicts um, in different in um, public health service and in private institutions. And one of the things that got me really frustrated when I was working there was uh, seeing how the patients or clients came in wanting to receive help and treatment. And then after a week or two, they wanted to leave, of course. Uh, so the uh, ambivalence is really outspoken um, when you work with uh, drug addiction. So it was actually um, my frustration that was the driving force into the doctorate. Mm. Um, so that that is my that was my way in into the work. Yeah. Hmm. Frustration can be a, a good, a good force to do things, to have things done. So, what did you, what did you find? You did, you did all this work, all this research about the transport, the importance of the transpersonal in in this treatment. Can you say what what you found? Sure. Um, before I go there, Eva, I, I would just like to give people. Um, a little, at least those who don't know me, a little more information about my background. Uh, and then I'll jump into the findings afterwards. That's okay? That's okay. Yeah. So um, I'm a Norwegian woman born and raised in Norway um, in my best age, 54. Uh, and um, I did my basic training at um, the Psychosynthesis Institute in Gothenburg. Um, I did my master's in psychosynthesis psychotherapy at the Trust in London. Um, and then I completed my doctorate in 2016, uh, which I did at um, Metanoia uh, in collaboration with um, Middlesex University. So I started out in 1999 as a therapist and um, in 2001, I started teaching psychosynthesis uh, and have been doing that for 20 years um, on all, all levels. Um, for a couple of years, I also worked in, uh, at University of Southeast Norway, where I run a master's degree um, training for nurses who wanted to work with um, um, psychiatric care. So, um, so um, the reason why I want to share this is, is for you to know where I come from and my reference background in, in both uh, the psychiatric domain and, uh, and the drug, drug addict, drug addiction domain, and also as a psychosynthesis therapist. 
All right. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. You must excuse. I am I'm such a curious being, you know. <laughs> I just want to go <laughs> go. So so back to the to the work then. Uh, what did you what did you see and how was it? Um, well, um, actually, I was quite surprised by by the findings in in my doctorate. Um, I wanted to, um, as a psychosynthesis therapist uh, working within the transpersonal uh, area, I wanted to um have a frame that also was transpersonal so i chose um alcoholics uh, anonymous uh, aa um and i chose to do a qualitative um research project where i interviewed eight persons um and they were all uh sober and had um um, uh, between two and 17 years of sober time. And all of them were active in the AA. Um, and I interviewed them around their lived experience of their own will. Uh, and I started out asking them questions around what their experiences were uh, as an active addict. Mm. So how, how did they experience their own will as an active addict? And then I went on, went on to uh, ask questions around their uh, experience of their own will during um, the time where they chose to go into treatment and during treatment. And some of these um, eight persons, two or three, have never received uh, treatment from official healthcare or private institutions. They have only um, come to sobriety through uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, just just to clarify, you probably um, know this already, but uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is not an institution. It's a fellowship. And the people that run it, uh, they are all um, sober alcoholics. Uh, and uh, none of them, or mostly, have non-therapeutic uh, training. They have their own experience, and they have the um, instructions from what they call the big book, which is their Bible, uh, on how to move through the 12 steps that is so uh, typical for uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. So that was, uh, that was the setting and um, the findings, uh, the most um, interesting findings, I, I, I think, is actually the pattern that um, showed itself through the data around uh, what I uh, chose to call the will complex in active addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will complex uh, consists of three parts. And for the sake of um, reaching a broader audience, I chose to call these three uh, parts for intentions or intent. Uh, but in the psychosynthesis language, we can as uh, we can call them uh, subpersonalities. It's it's the same concept. So what I saw and what they described for me was that um, initially they all felt like victims of some kind, victims to um, domestic um, conditions, uh, victims to bullying, victims to um, belonging issues. Uh, so everybody had some some kind of experience of victimhood and and also um, a little bit further down the road they also felt a victim to the drug use itself uh, but this uh, this experience of being a victim um, made or uh, started the impulse of wanting to escape from the pain on, of victimhood. So the first um, intent or the first subpersonality sub, uh, in this complex, the will complex, I chose to call 
um, the destructive intent of escapism. Um, so the way the way I see it is that um, addiction is uh, trying to escape from the underlying pain, and that is this, the same. That is generalizable for any any addiction, really. Um, so, um, so if you tr it translate into psychosynthesis, it's, it's a subpersonality sub that wants to escape and escape. Uh, and in the escapism is also the um, denial and um, uh, and they de de develop into not wanting to take responsibility because that's that's the other side of the coin of being a victim. Is not wanting to take responsibility. Okay, so um, when we talk about drug addiction, we talk also about a drug addiction career. And um, career. Yeah. career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in, in the drug uh, addiction uh, career, um, there is a, a progressive destructive development. And um to uh, be able to administer and to uh, have the logistics and to create a world around the the use of um drugs that is alcohol pills and narcotics um, um they actually develop a new subpersonality and this second part I chose to call the omnipotent destructive intent. Um, and the word omnipotent is really important here because that's that's how um, how they manage to uh, live with um, the addiction is that uh, it's it's sort of um, grandiosity. Um, and it's, it's all about my will in my way. And with that comes manipulation and the moral code um, is deteriorating gradually. So uh, from um, day to day, from, year, from month to month and year to year, they step over their moral boundaries. And um, it often includes lies manipulation and further down the line criminal activities so there we have two out of three of uh, the intense or subpersonalities in in the will complex and way down the line after often uh, many years of drug abuse um, a third subpersonality or su third intent is developed and I chose to call this the impotent constructive intent. And um, if you listen to that, the impotent constructive intent. So it's impotent on one side and constructive on the other side, which is a paradox in itself. Um, and what I mean by that is um, they develop this intent to to want <clears throat> to want to change something, but there is a blind spot. So they develop this thought that if only, if only I move to a different country, if only I get three jobs, then I won't be drinking, I won't have time to drink. If only I get a girlfriend, if only I get education, if only I get a new apartment. <clears throat> and all of these eight persons that I interview, they they uh, all of them described have how um, they never, uh, it never helped. When they got the new apartment and nothing changed. When the, one person moved to another country and drank even more. Uh, one person got four jobs, uh, it didn't help in any way. And so they build this portfolio of, um, um, Mislyckethet, vad heter det på svensk? Uh, of, of failure. Failures, failure. yeah. Mm. Mm. So, and then um, they actually become a victim of their own behavior. 
which bites the tail of the first intention or the first subpersonality, which is a victim in the in in the out um, in in the core. So Does it make sense? The, the the last part I didn't really understand. Can I explain that? Yeah, sure. Bites so this tail. this third intent. Mm -hmm. uh, the impotent constructive, so the, the constructive part of that subpersonality is that they want to change something. They want to try to change something, but they change something out there. Yeah. They, they do not understand or see that they need to change something in here. Mm -hmm. So they try to change things out there and, and they fail. And they try again and they fail and they try again and they fail. Uh, and every time they fail, they feel more like a victim. Yeah, okay. Mm. Okay, so, so then uh, it's, it's full circle back to the first subpersonality. So that's, that's the will complex um, mm. that runs the addictive um, personality. That's the dance. Of yeah, the... that's right. Yeah, that's right. So having seen that, the, this pattern that you describe now so clearly it's a fantastic <laughs> you know all with the, all the sub personalities and seeing that the outer is not helping the outer changes are impossible they are not helping at all is it there where the the where the transpersonal where the the inner work is starting or what well, what is next uh, in, in I, I, the healing, I, I, I would say I wish I wish it was, but uh, in uh, reality, it's usually not. Um, the pattern is that um, the downhill road is just continuing um, with more abuse, more drug abuse, um, uh, more uh, stepping over their own boundaries, um, denial of responsibility, and this continues. Often it continues until they reach a point where the, the total pain, the life pain is so severe that something needs to happen. And, and, and the pain is described in two different ways. So about 50% described the pain as uh, the fear of dying. Dying from uh, physical, um, illnesses mm -hmm. uh, and the other description was a total loss of face so for example one person described uh, as a young dad uh, he was driving a car on the on the highway and he had his two children in the back seat and he was um, under the influence of alcohol and he was stopped by the police uh, need it, it tested and he lost his driver's license and that was um, in itself a loss of face but in, a, in addition to that the policeman that tested him was a friend of his father mm. so that was his total loss of pain so it was as if his, his um, grandiosity couldn't deny the realities and that was when um, they call it uh, hitting bottom yeah. or hitting, hitting rock bottom, exactly. which, which yeah. feels like um, uh, the total, total loss, total breakdown. And in that moment, there is a different kind of will that breaks through, which I chose to call the, the core will. Mm. And in psychosynthesis terms, it would be the will of, of the eye in the, in the middle of the egg. Okay, Which so is... it's so it's like it needs to. I mean, I mean, alcoholism, for instance, is described as this progressive illness. So it's like it has to, for this to happen, it has to go so far until it uh, can change. It seems. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So, so you talk about uh, the importance of the that you, you now you describe the dynamics of the will in this in this model yeah. as i understand it and then you also talk about the transpers that the transpersonal dimension is needed that's right why, why is that why is it needed um 
I think uh, it's it's quite obvious if if we as psychosynthesis uh, therapists look look at uh, the egg and if we do not have contact with the center of the egg, the point where the eye uh, is held. Um, all of us know uh, the implications of that in relation to working with clients in general. And it's the same for, um, for uh, substance abuses that uh, without, well, without any contact with the eye, the will of the eye, there is nowhere to disidentify to. And as we, as we know, the I is connected to the higher self and the transpersonal will. Mm. So as, as a means of self-containment and a means of um, stepping out of the grip of the, the three compensations of the will complex, which are compensatory wills, they are not the authentic wills, they are compensations. Um, so, so we need to uh, um, facilitate a treatment where, where drug addicts can become conscious and help to get in contact with, with the eye. And um, I think that Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step fellowship is uh, extremely skilled at this. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic... Um, um, therapeutic uh, treatment to to work through the uh, through the steps and and it's only driven by the individual's own will. There's not an, an institution. There, there's no one else that drives the person's journey through the twelve steps. Um, and and the steps themselves are transpersonal. So so mm -hmm. I learned a lot about how to incorporate the transpersonal in treatment with uh, drug addicts uh, drug addicts mm -hmm. um, for example so one of the one of the means that uh, aa use is uh, prayer which is something we don't usually use in psychosynthesis um, they also use um, they call it the gratitude gratitude attitude which mm -hmm. is uh, writing a list every day uh, of the things that they are gratitude of, that they are grateful for, mm -hmm. um, and and reading them out loud, thinking through them what what they are actually grateful for, which takes them out of the omnipotence, takes them out of uh, the grandiosity, um, and and back to the the more um, transpersonal. Uh, foundation or base of the personality. Um, in addition to that, so they describe how the fellowship itself becomes what they call a higher power. That's how they describe uh, our term is the higher self or the universal self, and their term is the higher power. Um, and um, when you come into the fellowship and you maybe you have only a few days without um, alcohol or other drugs in your blood, uh, you are received as an equal. You are received with dignity. You are received with respect. Um, and that is something that people who have been using for a long time, they usually don't meet that anywhere else. They're often use, uh, met with uh, stigma. Um, so just for them to come into that space and be welcomed, warm welcomed and understood because all the other people who have gone before and have become sober, uh, they know exactly what it's like to be them. Yeah. And they, they also have nowhere to hide. And they have gone before and they have um, managed something that themselves haven't managed yet. So in, in those terms, they are a higher power uh, and a, a place to belong, which also is something that um, um, 
gets lost during the addiction career because there is a tendency to isolate and to hide and the shame and the anxiety is often very pronounced. Yeah. I don't know if that was an answer to your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's so interesting. And I, I think that, I mean, what I, as far as I know, uh, the 12 step movement is has so good results when it mm -hmm. comes to, to, you know, what really happens to the people that really go to take, go walk the steps, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, and I wonder for us as practitioners, so what would you say, because I, I, I love it when you describe the attitude to the person where they come into the circle and we as practitioners, when we work with people, what can, what can we learn from this? Many of us don't work with people that have an active addiction. Uh, would you say that, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, what do, what do you think about the, the psychotherapy, the psychosynthesis therapy situation according um, to these, these problems? Well, I think psychosynthesis in itself as, um, it, it's philosophy, it's theory, it's tools. Uh, foundation is is a very uh, is a great space for an addict to come into. But in at least in the basic training that I did, uh, there wasn't much um, skill or knowledge or education related to drug addiction. And I I really think that is needed that um, therapists need to have an additional training to work with uh, uh, drug addicts because it's such a um, difficult field it's such a high level of, of manipulation and denial mm -hmm. and and also the 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 victimhood creates such a strong transference in the room so it it uh, it requires a very skilled therapist, uh, which can sit heavily in himself or herself. It requires uh, knowledge uh, about the, the different um, sequences that a person goes through when it uh, uh, goes through a detox, for example. A de some people think that detox is when you have detox, then, then you're ready when you, you when you've gone through the withdrawal symptoms, uh, then it's, it's all good. But uh, that's when it that's when the work starts because um, uh, addiction is a behavioral um, disease. And um, for example, just to, to know that um, addiction can wander. So if one person stops using alcohol. Um, the behavior can move into exercise, into sexual relations, into um, food, yeah, whatever gaming. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you need you need to have some some uh, the theoretical background or a little more information about the nature of addiction, and um, to be able to have some sort of map and orient yourself in, in what kind of la landscape you are finding yourself when you sit with a client that has an addiction. I would not, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I would not recommend, starting, <clears throat> starting to work with um, a client that is in active addiction. Mm. Um, At least um, I would I would initially start to, to map the, the drug history, the pre preferred drug, the use, the um, uh, sequence, the, from how many years, what's the life situation, uh, what's the network, <clears throat> economical situation, and um, and then do an evaluation, but. What they do say themselves, I have, I have not been an ad addict myself, so fortunately, but I have learned that um, they say themselves that it takes at least two years before they uh, get access to their emotional body. Mm. 
mm -hmm. after they have stopped using. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I really agree. That's also, you know, I've, what I've seen that it takes really some, you know, special education to, to really work with active addicts. And, and but then I also, you know, have this question, the things that you mentioned, you know, exercise, gaming, uh, food, uh, uh, work, you know, there, there are so many things that we can uh, be addicted to. And many of these things are like, so spread in our society. It's like we are, it's like we are all addicts in some way. And it is like the, the society is a, an addictive society. There is a, um, yeah, there is this, this notion, this concept actually, and I think it comes from the 12 step movement from, to start with the addictive society. And, and I wonder what you think about um, about that and and if we all are how can i say because also what you describe is this is very complex you know i don't know really what my question is but when you describe the 12 step group it's like you dis also describe another society another another ethics another way of meeting each other mm -hmm. and and when we look at what what we often i mean the dark side <laughs> to say of, of what our society is fighting with or struggling with, it's it's like the opposite: isolation and hostility and and competition and all these things that are actually maybe driving or creating addiction, like addiction, addictive thinking. So I wonder what you what you what is your take on that? The, and, and, and that also that included in that is that what is addiction? What is it? Can we define it? Can, maybe we we will need to start there. What is addiction? Um, <clears throat> then I would like to include the word dependence, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> maybe start there because everybody, ev everybody, everyone is dependent on something. We are dependent on air, on food on shelter, on warmth, <clears throat> social contact. So, so we ha all have dependencies which are healthy and necessary, normal, natural. And then we have dependencies that are more like habits, mm. uh, dependent on uh, one chocolate per day or um, shower every morning. Um, coffee. Coffee, <laughs> <clears throat> dependent on... Um, uh, reading the news, checking mm. your phone, going onto Facebook, um, which are not destructive <clears throat> in itself. It's more like habits. Mm. Um, and dependence, <clears throat> when we talk about um, addiction, dependence is more physical. <clears throat> So, so dependence related to um, addiction is more uh, about tolerance. For example, if one person is admitted to the hospital to have a um, uh, to have an uh, what's, what's it called Sur surgery surgery. Thank you yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> on their back, and and afterwards they are offered more morphine or painkillers. Uh, and after some time, you will need more morphine and more painkillers to, to numb the pain. So that's that's about the tolerance that you're depend you're de dependent on more stimuli. Uh, and then after some time, you can start to experience withdrawal symptoms. So if you take away the painkillers, you can be nauseous or you can experience um, fear, anxiety. And if you ignore those signals and um, downplay them and deny them and just continue and increase the level of uh, painkillers, that's when you move over into addiction. Mm. Um, and when you're really into substance disorder, uh, that's when you plan your life around the substance used. 
So that's, it's called the first lover. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you start to plan all your life, all the logistics every day, the first thing you think uh, in the morning and the first, the last thing you think about in the evening, and that, that's a full blown um, addiction. And when it comes to uh, society and more the collective, I, I think that we at least are um, codependent yeah. on many things, on our, uh, the economical system, the health system, uh, social system, social welfare. Um, but I think also maybe um, the market forces or economical forces um, have their playground amongst us in trying to sell us the ideal life, um, a happy life, and make us um, materially, ma materialists and, and wanting to um, reach out for the, the out, outer fix, mm -hmm. like uh, a wonderful house or car or boat or clothes or face or body or whatever creates a status or make you feel that you belong or that you are worthy uh, which is a, a compensation so in that respect maybe it's um, parallel to to the more severe drug addiction actually mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah and I, th I think also when i think of as you talked about in the beginning, you said that addiction has to do with emptiness or, you know, the feeling a, a void or a victimhood. A, we, yeah. What did you say? Yeah. Vi victimhood. Yeah, victimhood, but also, <clears throat> also that there was also connection to, to meaning or loss of meaning or uh, loss of connection. And I think maybe it's there that uh, psychosynthesis is important also with like the transpersonal, the connection to something bigger, uh, that, uh, you know, not as a treatment maybe, but as a, and like, a, oh God, I can't find the word now. Um, what is the English word? I don't, can't even what's, find the Swedish word. What's the word. Swedish word? For, also for, uh, also that man förebygga. What is that in English? Prevent. What did you say? Prevent. Prevent. Yeah, a pre like a prevent to connect with oneself on a, on a deeper level is like could could that be like a a prevention or a, I mean like <laughs> a, that like we stand stronger against the the pull into addiction when it's it's like all around us. There are possible addictions all around us. What did what do you think? Um, I absolutely love psychosynthesis and uh, of course I think uh, we as a community are really important our the the space that we offer our clients it's really important the trainings that we have are really important for um, not just to educate more therapists but but also for the growth and the depth that we can offer people um, and I think that is in contrast to the objectification that society uh, sort of um, maybe is like a new, new religion that we, we become objects to the ideal uh, more than we are subjects to ourselves. So um, I think, well, I don't only think, but my experience through uh, 20 years as a therapist is, is that um, what we offer is real, it's authentic, mm -hmm. um, and we facilitate uh, authenticity for the persons that we work with. And um, it's, it's an enormously important contribution to, to the society because um for every person we work with they they bring that back to their friends and families and workplaces so um, um i absolutely um more than ever uh, think that that what the work we do is really really important 
that brings me to think of uh, the, another concept that we talked about, uh, and that is sobriety. So what is, uh, I mean, it's, it's clear what sobriety means when it comes to, uh, when it comes to substances because it means no substance in the system, <laughs> and then I'm sober. But is, can, we, can we use that concept also for, you talk about authenticity, and, and uh, is, is there a connection there with the, the sober, the sobriety? Yes, I actually think it is. And I think that we, without substances, we can um, intoxify ourselves with, um, negative self-talk by um, not seeing our own self-worth um, and downgrade ourselves. Um, and sobriety, I actually uh, Googled sobriety before this meeting and um, it was very beautiful when I read that. You, uh, sobriety is also used in relation to new, a newborn baby, uh, mm. which is maybe the ultimate expression of sobriety, the, the, the cleanliness, the, the, the fresh, the new, the, um, and, and, and also deeply spiritual being that a newborn baby is. So uh, I guess that's maybe the best answer I can give right now about to that. Yeah, thank you so beautiful the answer is like sobriety became a transpersonal quality <laughs> sure yeah hmm. yes so um safira do you feel that we have missed out on something now is it anything i think actually that we have covered all the questions that uh, i had on my list Sure. I think I just would like to add uh, um, a few comments relating to my research, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah. Um, because there were other findings also um, related to the continued journey of, uh, of moving into sobriety and, and treatment through the 12 steps. And one phenomenon that was really interesting was two persons out of the eight um they had a surrender experience and surrender is a concept that we do not at least uh, where i was trained we do not use the concept of surrender um in therapy and that is a concept that's very central to the 12 steps which um, basically is to hand over surrender give over not to give up but to give over to something that is greater than me um and they have a prayer in the third step where they choose to surrender their will and their life uh, to a higher power. And two of these persons had done that with their mentor. They have a mentor system, um, sat down and done the third step prayer. And both these persons, a man and a woman, they described how they were filled with um, an intense light um, for the woman, it, it entered the window from up above and came into her forehead and filled the emptiness she had in, mm -hmm. in her upper body. And for the man, um, he experienced an intense, intensely light presence. Uh, and both of these persons, without knowing about each other, of course, they said that the choice of drinking was taken away from me. And I think that as a phenomenon in itself is, is extremely interesting mm -hmm. um, from a transpersonal perspective. So if I had the, the means and, and the possibility, that's where I wanted to continue my research and, and um, understand more about that phenomenon. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds like a fantastic uh, research <laughs> okay. to go deeper into that. And, and thank you for, for sharing all this with us and for being here and for doing what you do. And um, if people want to contact you, how do they find you? Um, you can search me up on Facebook, my name, and just send me a message. Or you can go to my website, which is 
um, in Norwegian. Maybe you can write it in the chat, uh, Eva. Uh, it's Din Samtale Partner. I can write it down myself, maybe. Maybe it's better you write it in, in maybe I can misspell it since it's Norwegian. <laughs> can you do it? Yeah. It's unfortunately in uh, Norwegian. Yeah, but now it's there, the insamtalepartner.com. Great. Yeah. But there are also, um, you, can, you can chat with me there or send me an email. And if you're English speaking, who wants or needs um, supervision related to client work with um, addicts, um, you're more than welcome to, to text me or message me or contact me. Thank you so much, Safira, for this uh, for this talk. And uh, now we will end this interview, and we will keep on with uh, with a meeting in the breakout room. So I will stop here. <laughs>